Hi, I'm Zivi Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This 30-minute podcast features a new author interviewed by me every single day, 365 days a year for about 30 minutes. I am also the publisher for Zibby Books, which publishes 12 books a year in fiction and memoir. Our books are already out now. You can check it out on zibbybooks.com. And we have a magazine called Zibby Mag, where we have lots of wonderful essays and lifestyle features. That's at zibbymag.com. We have classes at zibbyclasses.com. And I recently opened a bookstore in LA called Zibby's Bookshop at 1113 Montana Avenue at 11th Street in Santa Monica. I hope that you are able to enjoy some of our other offerings. But this here podcast is the basis of all of it and started in 2018. And no matter what I do, this is basically my favorite thing. Enjoy. Jancy Dunn is the author of Hot and Bothered, What No One Tells You About Menopause and How to Finally Feel Like Yourself Again. Jancy is the well columnist for the New York Times. For over two decades, she has written about health for publications such as Vogue, Health, The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, and Outside, among others. For a dozen years, she was a reporter and editor at Rolling Stone. She was the editor of a longtime column about ethical issues for O, The Oprah Magazine, and was a sex columnist at GQ. She is also the New York Times bestselling author of nine books. Don't you love how she just throws that in there? She lives in New Jersey with her husband, the author Tom Vanderbilt, and their daughter. Welcome, Jancy. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss Hot and Bothered, What No One Tells You About Menopause and How to Feel Like Yourself Again. Thank you for having me. Well, this couldn't come at a better time. I am one of the, what, 30 million people between ages 40 and 50, whatever, that you talk about in the book that are consistently ignored, never talked to about menopause, all of the stuff. So I am in your audience. I am a <laughs> such an eager recipient of all the information. And this book was so funny. I love you and your mom and like the whole thing and all of the scenes that you tell and write about. And I just, you know, I just, I loved it. It was really fun. It was like a memoir told in, you know, outrage. <laughs> Thank you so much. I, I tried to, you know, it's a difficult subject. So there, I really had to think about the approach and to make it sort of funny and relatable because it's major. Yeah, it's true. So the first, one of the first points you make is how little people talk about menopause, not just us as people and not just as a society, but doctors and how so often people are misdiagnosed and haven't go to so many different doctors because they're like, what, 34 different symptoms, maybe more, 43, what, a million essentially. <laughs> so talk about, talk about that. Okay. Or talk it's, about anything. Talk about why you wrote the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, the misinformation, it's on a couple levels, right? I mean, there's the fact that it's, you know, menopause is the intersection of sexism and ageism, right? And older women, you know, in medicine, it's like you fall off a cliff after you have babies. And most, there was this famous study I, I cited in the book that OBGYNs get exactly one hour of menopause training. Um, even when you go to the doctor, you know, when you're younger, when you're in your childbearing years, there's a lot of procedure-based medicine. But when you're older, it's mostly about kind of like sitting down and talking about lifestyle changes and things like that. And then I'm a health journalist. I've been doing this for decades and I couldn't find any information, nor could I connect the dots. When I started getting symptoms, first of all, I didn't know that perimenopause, peri meaning around, the years leading up to menopause, it happens most often in a woman's 40s. I thought it was kind of golden girl's land, like some distant time period in my life. But it happened when I, I started getting symptoms when I was 45. At the time, I had a toddler. So I was in toddler land. I was going to bouncy castles and, you know, all that stuff. I certainly wasn't thinking about menopause or perimenopause. So I got a few symptoms, including... um my heart started racing and I'm the run to the doctor type. Are you a run to the doctor type? I, I go for everything. I now do not go for checkups. I only go when I have problems. I'm just like the worst kind of patient. But anyway, yes. oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that was me too, actually. And instead of, you know, being on top of it, I thought, oh Lord, I have a racing heart. I went to a cardiologist. He said, I don't know what's wrong with you. You seem fine. And 
a couple of these symptoms piled up. I started getting bizarrely dry skin. Had no idea it was perimenopause. So wait, can I read the passage? I actually dog eared this one when you talk about your dry skin on your neck, which was like the funniest. Wait, hold on. I have to read this section and then you talk about the rest. Wait, keep talking in a minute. Wait, hold on. You said, wait, was this it? Hold on. I had it right here. She said, dryness is a recurring theme, which in my case tracked everything on my body that was capable of becoming parched did so from scalp to feet. Even my ears, normally fairly supple as far as ears go, assumed the precise leathery texture of Trader Joe's unsulfured just mango slices. My suddenly dry neck shed so much skin that my white towels turned brown. Perimenopausal sisters, I implore you to switch this minute to invest in a rich neck cream. And then I just have to read this next paragraph. My nether regions experienced a calamitous climate change, swiftly going from tropical lush to arid desert. Sex with my husband felt like he had strapped on a condom made of astroturf. The hair on my head not only thinned, but seemingly migrated down my body to sprout in unwelcome WTF places such as my inner wrist. (laughs) Oh my God, you're so funny. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is it is a constellation of, I mean, you know, some experts would that I interviewed for the book said, oh, some people sail through menopause with no symptoms. I haven't met any of those people, but apparently they do exist. But yes, and it's, it's bizarre, some of these symptoms and the dryness was just another level. And they, they hit, you know, in, in these groups sometimes, but I didn't put it together. I didn't, I never thought, oh, this is perimenopause. I just thought, oh, this is just stuff that happens in midlife or what now, you know, my ears have dried up. So when I finally figured out what was happening and started doing research, I I, I thought, oh, okay, so I'm actually on track. I'm in my 40s and this is starting to happen. And how I wish that women were informed of these changes that they're going to, you know, start happening. Like if, if, if I knew in my late 30s or something, then at least I would be prepared because there's treatments for a lot of this stuff. Yeah, I know the dryness. It's it is just and sex hurt so much. And I was avoiding my husband. And that's the thing too is okay, going back to what you had asked earlier about how we don't talk about it. I didn't I never had a single conversation about menopause with my mother. I talked to her all the time. We talk about everything you can imagine. Never had a conversation, didn't talk to my sisters about it, my friends, because it's still taboo, which is silly because it affects half the population. And it's not a disease. It's a natural stage of your life. And when you enter menopause, you don't go through it. You you enter it and you kind of stay there. And you can stay there for decades. So why wouldn't we talk about something that is so profound in your life? So now I make a, a practice. I mean, not just because I wrote the book, but I just, I talk about menopause. You know, I tell people all the time, if, if you feel safe talking to somebody about it, Talk about it. It's the only way. You know, it, it's starting at a grassroots level where people are talking more about it. You know, people like you, thank goodness, you're having me on your podcast to talk about it. Like, it's it's all moving forward. And my hope is that when my kid, who's now 14, is, you know, in her 40s, she'll be like, oh, all right, menopause. You know, that it'll just be banal, as it should mm-hmm. be. That was a long answer. No, no, it was great. No, I mean, I think it's one of those things that is losing its stigma, you know, mental health things for like this, Mm -hmm. but I still feel, and maybe, and it's, it's almost a nice bookend because of, are you there? God, it's me, Margaret coming out again this summer and this book, it's like the two, you talk about them as bookends, the whole journey and the book. It, it, I feel like those are the two sort of capstone books now of this experience, right? This is when it starts. This is when it ends. And, you know, I don't know, maybe we need some sort of celebration, but I think what you also point out is that there is no one definitive test because hormones shift all the time. So you can't like say a hundred percent, like, okay, this is exactly where you are right now. You could, you could go in and get blood tests every day for a month to have to figure the whole thing out. So it's not like it's easy for people to, they have to just, you just kind of have to guess. Like, it's not like it happens on a date, like your first period or something. Right. I mean, you know, I know people are reassured by tests. I understand that, but every single expert, I don't even know how many experts I talked to for this book said, save your money. You know, it's expensive. It's out of pocket when you take these tests and your hormones do change by the day. And most doctors, 
you know, if they sit down and talk to you and get all the symptoms can make a diagnosis just by finding out your symptoms. And of course, the definition of menopause is you've been without a period for a year, a whole year. So even if you get it like in, you know, month nine, then you have to go back to the beginning and count up for another 12 (laughs) months, which is also something I didn't know. (laughs) I didn't know that one of the best treatments for menopause was weed. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Hmm. That was a huge surprise to me that all these everybody's like taking gummies and everything for menopause symptoms. This blew my mind. Pretty much all my friends. And, you know, I interviewed many of them um, kind of in disguise for the book, but there isn't for, you know, kind of obvious reasons, there hasn't been many studies on it. It anecdotally these women say that it's helping a lot, everything from irritability to sleeping, but the data is not there yet. But that doesn't stop everyone from popping gummies like crazy because, you know, women need solutions. And so who can blame them? And if it works, great. That's the thing too, is I I detail all these treatments in the book and every menopause experience is different. So if it works for you, great. You know, there's not a ton of data on some of these like, you know, herbal supplements, but, you know, if it works and you're not deranged from hot flashes, great. <laughs> you, the, one of the funniest scenes was when you were preparing for that interview and you were drenched in sweat and you were, had like three different fans going and you were trying to like play it so cool for, I think, Vanity Fair or something like that. And just like trying to hide, <laughs> trying so hard to hide the flashes. So funny. I was melting like a snowman. It was awful. And I had, it it really, my hair was blowing, which must have looked ridiculous from the fans, but I had to stop sweating. Like it was really, really obvious and my makeup was melting down. It just, and who can understand, you know, it was a, it was a, a younger celebrity and until you're in it, they really don't understand because I can remember I worked for, I used to be a reporter at Rolling Stone. And every time I had to interview an older female, you know, musician, like Cher or somebody, they would say, okay, so ask her what it's like to get older. And I would, you know, I didn't even realize how obnoxious that question was. Like, you know, and I can remember Dolly Parton said, it sucks in that (laughs) accent. And I I love that. But like, it also sucks to be asked that question by some stupid 25-year-old who, you know, that being me, who just didn't realize. I mean, that's a, that's the thing too that makes me feel so depressed is that, you know, again, until you're going through it, you just don't have that empathy for your menopausal sisters. And then when I talked to my mother, I said, so what was your experience like? She used to sell office furniture. So she would be in this conference room with a bunch of men and she would be dripping like I was. And she she said that she'll never forget the sound of her sweat dripping onto the conference table. Plop, plop, plop. And she she wouldn't know what to do. She she learned not to wear white blouses because she would get so soaked and then her bra would show. And I just thought, God, I didn't know any of this. You know, I can, I, I found some diaries not long ago that I had saved. Did you save your diaries? But did you keep a diary and did you save your diaries? Kept di- many diaries, saved them all. Have you looked through them recently? No, but I walked into my office one day and my teenage son was like sitting on my windowsill, like deep into this one. And he's like, mom, this is when you'd had five drinks and like blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, let's put that down. And he kept talking about all these people. And he's like, where were you? And I was like, well, who, like, give me some more context. Anyway, he kept mentioning all these people. I have no idea who they were. I have no memory of these people at all. I basically have finally figured out it was a summer trip I went on, but okay, the name's to your menopause point, I have no memory at all. I can't remember anything anymore. I name slip everything. So oh, yes, please. I haven't, I haven't read them recently, but I probably should. The long answer. I mean, I, I find this fascinating because I read my diaries for the first time. I, I have a, a, a daughter who's 14 and I thought, oh, well, show you know, maybe, maybe she can relate. And I looked through them and it was all about, oh, my mom is so crabby. Oh, my mom is, you know, oh, what's wrong with her? She's so irritable. And I was just clueless. And mm-hmm. and now, of course, I put it together that that's what was going on with her. And I just, I just didn't know. So yeah, I don't know. I feel bad. But yeah. now we talk about it a lot. My daughter was asking me the other day about like now I have a belly, which, you know, I used to have other places that the weight deposited, which I had become good at figuring out how to 
conceal. But anyway, now it's uh, there's a lot of weight in my belly. And my daughter was like, so what did you do from before until now? So like when I grow up, <laughs> I had no idea. You're like what she was asking for tips. Other, yeah, looking for tips. Like, what did you do wrong, mom? Type of thing. And I was like, well, honey, when you're a certain age, you're you go through menopause and all of a sudden your metabolism slams on the brakes and you get a belly. Congratulations. <laughs> that's a that's a nice, simple way to put it. You know, because that was another thing that I wrote about is that I was kind of keeping it a secret from my husband. I was playing into that stigma, that unnecessary stigma. And you know, when sex started to hurt, when I was running to the bathroom a lot more often, I didn't tell him like a very simple explanation. Like you gave to your daughter, like it's kind of like reverse puberty and the hormones are leaving my body. It makes the tissues a lot more irritable because, you know, estrogen keeps your skin supple. And that's why I have a little, why I race to the bathroom, why I cringe and grimace during sex, which is probably not an aphrodisiac. And once I explained to him, then it was, then the, then the pressure was up. He assumed I didn't care for him anymore. Mm. And, and you know, I was doing him a disservice because then he was able to know what was going on with me and he could sort of be in on it with me instead of, you know, and, and PS, he's getting older too. He's getting older too. Like we're all getting older. And so, you know, it's not the sexiest topic in the world, but I, I felt immediately better after I talked to him about it. Yeah. I, I said something recently to my husband too. I said something like, you know, I've I've passed my prime. <laughs> <laughs> and did he know that that was a cue for him to say, no, you haven't? Did he, did he how did he no, respond? Now he's making all sorts of funny jokes about it because he's very funny. So, you know, whenever I do something now, I don't know anything that he just makes jokes. Like, like, oh, here's your prime, huh? You know, like, <laughs> yeah, here we go. Here I am in my prime. But it's not exactly something you want to like advertise to your partner as like, you know, because it's not like the most, I mean, not like they don't see you in all your various glory anyway, but I don't know. There's some allure that's like, it's mixed up with like coloring your hair and like wrinkles and like this compulsion to like, you know, hide that you're not, this young, youthful, dewy spouse. A hundred percent. I mean, and 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 I had that exact, you know, dilemma as well. And it even extended to when, you know, you often get brain fog. I certainly did. I was very worried because that's when I started writing the book and I thought, oh, how am I going to even talk about this if I can't remember, you know, words? And I would trail off. I remember saying to Tom, my husband, like, can you hand me the, I could not think of the words butter knife to say, I, I really, I yelled that the shiny thing, the shiny thing, you spread butter on it. Like I, I could not remember. And I thought, oh boy, this is not good. But there is very good research. Many experts told me the brain fog goes away. And I just found that so exciting. Like it, it really isn't all bad. And when you lose something and it's returned to you, I, I think that's a miracle. And so, in fact, my brain fog did largely go away. I mean, some of it is just, you know, getting older and it'll never go away, but but much of it did. And my memory became sharp again, and I was able to remember what a butter knife was. And so that was a plus. And and now I'm mostly kind of through it. I'm I'm out at the other side. I went through menopause properly. I, I, you know, did the year long thing. Oh, see, maybe I do have brain fog, the year long thing. And, and now I wait, what year long thing? What do you mean? Like the hormone, the, you're like, asking for it, clarification. I know because just what a am little I bit. saying? Just a yeah. smidge. I, w- I went officially through menopause because I went a whole year without having my period. Oh, the 12th. That's, what they, that's the translation of the year long thing. Okay. And I remember at one point I was swimming. I used to do open water swimming where you swim in large bodies of water. And I remember getting, you know, it's not an official term of flash period, but I got an epic period while I was swimming in the water and a group of barracuda were following me. So that was a little awkward. I really had like the crime scene period that you read about. However, that said, I am now through everything. I get a hot flash every once in a while, but it's more like, you know, Miami than... Satan's (laughs) Satan's <laughs> space heater, right? It's like mild. It's not so bad. I wake up occasionally. But once you're through, it's kind of 
great. And you really do revert back. I was just listening to Jane Fonda talking about this, that you revert back to your your pre-menstrual self when you were like a you know a kid and kind of a, a weirdo and you're you're fully inhabiting your weird self. And that's the way I feel now. And it's kind of great. You remember how you used to be before the whole period thing started before, you know, you were kind of tethered to your your monthly cycles of one way or another. And I'm not anymore. I don't, you know, I know how I, I know it sounds so menopositivity that I don't care what people think. If I did care what people think, would I be talking about how I pee myself, you know, on your podcast, which, you know, it, I, I really don't care. And that's freeing also. And I told my daughter, you know, I'm in my 50s. And she said, what was the best decade? that you've ever had, fully expecting me to say, you know, my teenage years or my 20s or whatever. And I really think it's now. And I'm just having a lot of fun now. I don't know. It's, it's, who would have thought if you had told, if I had told myself that when I was her age, I would have said, yeah, right. You know, that's some sort of like propaganda that you tell people when they get older to make them feel better. (laughs) But it's not true. In my case, anyway, I don't know. My mom actually always told me that the 40s were her favorite time. And my grandmother would always say, like, she felt like people told her she looked better and better the older she got. And she's like, I've never looked better than in my 90s. This is like, I'm hitting my stride. (laughs) See, I want to be like that. It's like my my mom just called me recently and said, oh, there was this old lady in the supermarket. She was getting on my nerves. She wouldn't move. And I was behind her and I was getting so impatient. And I thought, you're 82. Like, you know, it's it's that that expression that old age is 15 years older than you are. And mm-hmm. I think that's, you know, people's just general discomfort with being labeled as old, which I do get. And my mom doesn't consider herself old. I don't know what, I don't know if I can even ask her, like, what is, what is old to you, you know? But yeah, you know, every age has has its difficulties, but also it's joys. Oh, is this, these are, these are, am I, am I saying things that are like making you throw up? But it's it's really true. I actually, I thought it was really interesting when you talked about grandparents for a while, how, when you said that women live longer than men, how scientists think that's because women are such good caregivers for the young, for their grandkids. And so they should live longer so that they can help take care of the young. I had never known that before. And I like love evolutionary stuff like that. That does make sense, doesn't it? Does, it it does make sense. I just have scientist, but yeah, it makes it. sense. Although now we were just talking about this at the times, but there's there's a couple different biotech companies that want to eliminate menopause forever. Like the, hmm. one company said that that was the moonshot to just delay it and delay it so that you <laughs> don't go through it and that you're, you know, in sync with men who can, you know, like male rock stars who can run around fathering children, hmm. you know, when they're... 80 or whatever. So I don't know if that's a good idea or not. It's kind of an interesting area, delaying menopause, but. Well, the idea of getting rid of all the symptoms of it and all that sounds good, Mm -hmm. but indefinitely being able to have children, like these poor kids who are going to have like 90 year old parents, (laughs) you know, like nobody will be able to pick them up. I don't know. (laughs) Speaking of kids, another fun thing that I always ask people is the, the best age for a kid. And I know every kid is different. But I, I love the age of seven. And I also love 13 for my daughter. Like, like, what do you think it is? Like, what ages are especially sweet to you? Oh, my gosh. I love, I, I mean, I have an eight and a nine-year-old right now and two mm-hmm. 16-year-olds. And mm-hmm. like this, I, I agree. I think this like seven, eight, nine, ten. 10, that, oh, my gosh. Like, it's really, it's because they're verbal enough that you can have like really funny, interesting conversations, but yes. they're not old enough to like have a total attitude or anything. So yeah. Yep. They still think you're cool. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Oh my gosh. Okay. So what is coming next for you? You wrote this book. You can have it. You're a reporter, journalist, everything. Like where do you go from here? You've told the world your innermost secrets. You've written... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> what next? Are you going back to more purely reported stuff? Are you diving deeper into this whole menopause lifestyle thing? W- where are you going? You know, I don't know. My books, I mean, they definitely reflect kind of what's going on with me. And I, I've been, I've been looking around and I don't know, I don't know what to do next. I, I write about health and wellness. So that's always like an area that I like. 
I I really don't know. I I wonder if there's a way, as you say, to kind of delve more deeply with menopause and just kind of aging in general. Yeah, I don't know. It took me long enough to figure out this book. Uh, You know, even a couple of years ago, I floated the idea to people, to publishers and my agent and People said, mm, no, you know, no. And now things have really changed. And that's mm-hmm. when I get, when I feel frustrated, it's not like, you know, policies are reflecting that now, right? Or anything like that. But even a few years ago, things are really different. Like we are moving forward about awareness, just as you said earlier. And it's it's great. Like, you know, it seems slow, but it's it's really not. So I don't, I, this is my suggestion for you. I yeah. think you should write- Ooh. Like a sitcom, I and mean, I know you referenced the times where menopause even played into things like All in the Family and whatever, but mm-hmm. I think you should do something because your mom character is so funny. I mean, I know she's actually your mom, but she's like a character in the book. <laughs> but right. like something with you and your mom and your daughter and have it be this like very funny, like three generations and have this whole theme sort of like between the periods or something. Okay, that is a great idea because you know, you you talk to authors, we're always looking for projects and it can be really hard sometimes. And oh, my mom would love that. When I do when I do book events, my mother sometimes stands up and answers the question. I mean, she, <laughs> she she would be so very much on board with this idea. Let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, there isn't when I was looking back on how menopause is represented in pop culture, there are a few television shows or movie scenes, but most of it is pretty abysmal. So yeah, we could we could certainly do better in that area. Yeah. Plus you have all these quotes from famous people. I think it I think you could really make this something fun and very cool. Thank I don't you. know. That's Thank your you task. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Where are you based, by the way? I think I read this, but now I can't remember. New Jersey. I used to live in Brooklyn for 20 years. And then my daughter didn't get into the public middle schools that she applied to. You hear this a lot. And so we put the apartment up for sale and I moved to New Jersey because I didn't expect, this is a long story. The, The short story is I have moved one town over from where I grew up for various reasons. And so Daily, I drive by the cul-de-sac where I used to make out with Mike Mikulski. Is that a good thing? Is that a good thing to be so immersed in your past? This is, is it perfect comforting? for the sitcom? This is perfect for the sitcom. And this is great because Margaret and her family, and are you there yet? It's God is me, Margaret. They moved to New Jersey also from New York. They did. I don't know. No. There's something there. You you can find it. It's a cosmic sign. Yeah, it's a cosmic yes. sign. Okay. Thank you so much. Jancy, not JC, Jancy Dunn, fellow odd name woman like myself. And uh, I'm glad you're in the area because I would love to meet you at some point. This is really fun. So let's do it. There's a lot to talk about, isn't there? Clearly. So thanks for having me. Scratching the surface. (laughs) Okay. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 